Good morning. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning here at Monrovia. Uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, we've started into December, so uh, getting into the holiday spirit and getting ready for Christmas. We are going to do some Christmas songs a little bit later and start uh, having a lesson uh, around Christmas that Ray will be doing for us. And then today is also our baby dedication day, so we'll be doing those activities in just a few minutes. So uh, thank you all for being here with us, and let's begin with a song. Let's all stand and sing together. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks. Bow with me, please. Dear God, our Father in heaven, blessed be your name. Help us all to remember the fact that you are our Father and we are your children. Help us to honor you, to live by the message that you have provided to us. Help us to be kind to one another. This time, God, I ask you to be with those amongst us who are sick and afflicted. Help them by touching them in any way that you can. And help us to understand them and to provide them any kind of help that we can. I ask you to be with our elders with our seniors, with our children. I ask you to be with this country and its leaders. And most of all, God, be with us this morning. And help us to honor you and praise you appropriately. And through Jesus I pray, amen.
We are so happy that God has blessed these seven families with healthy babies. And he has blessed our family at Monrovia here. And uh, we're so thankful that you all can be here today, uh, your parents and your grandparents. Uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, to be a part of this day. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask our, our shepherds to come up on the stage, please. And we have um, a gift that we're going to present uh, to each family, so I'll call you up one at a time. Uh, if you have other children, you're welcome to bring them up or leave them in the pew. That's it's your choice. Uh, so, first, we have Zach and Megan Riggins and their new son, Michael. Max and Sarah Williams and their daughter, Henry. Joe and Becky Moretti and their daughter, Amelia. Timothy and Gina Lape and their daughter, Emma. Johnny and Amy Davis and their daughter, Madison. Chris and Carrie Moore and their daughter Emerson. Scott and Sammy Smith and their son Patrick. Let's give all these families a hand. Okay, we're going to do two things now. First, we have a, a vow as, as these parents and these families dedicate their children to the Lord. And so I'm going to read this um, to all of you at once. And then uh, if you're willing to make this vow, uh, just... As you look at the audience, we'll all say three words in, in unison. So that your child may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, do you parents vow, by God's help and in partnership with the church, to provide your child a Christian home of love and peace, to raise your child in the truth of our Lord's instruction and discipline, and to encourage your child to one day trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Thank you. Now, uh, church, if you'll stand, please. And we are going to make a pledge together to these families. Uh, so let's all read this together. So that these children may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers, we vow by God's help, to be faithful to our calling as members of the body of Christ, to help these parents be faithful to God, and to help teach and train these children in the ways of the Lord, so that they might one day trust Him as Savior and Lord. Thank you, and be seated. And now one of our shepherds is going to have a prayer for all of our family. Shall we pray? 
Father, as we uh, dedicate these children, we want to hold them up to you. We want to hold their parents up in, in uh, their responsibility and our responsibility to them and their children to try to help guide them and teach them your ways. Father, help us as, as we use the wisdom that you've given to us, as we use the, uh, the Bible, as we use each other, as good Christians should, to love and, and cherish these children and, and help them to become uh, examples as, as Christ was for us. Father, help the parents as, as the children age older and older as they become uh, wanting to be adults but uh, still need the nurturing that they will have the, uh, the strength and the comfort of us and you. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to bring them to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's recognize them one more time as a family. Thank you. I'm sure these parents, as, as most of us did when they found out that they were going to have a child, uh, spent some time trying to come up with a name. Uh, you know, that's one of the things, and sometimes it's, it's fairly easy. Sometimes you agonize over it for a long time, but when you do choose that name, and that's, that's the, the name of your child, uh, that, become, that, that name becomes so sweet. But when we think about Jesus and what he's done for us, coming as a baby and then living as an example for us and, and taking our sins to the cross, his name becomes the sweetest name uh, that we know to all of us. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, let's sing that. No sweeter name. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. You are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. 
Jesus, 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 you are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. You are the life to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. I know that we usually come together and at this time and we remember that ultimate sacrifice. But you know the our God make that made a sacrifice for over 30 years when he sent his son down on this earth born on this earth to show us a lifelong example of how to do it right. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are here this morning. As has been mentioned, this time of the year, there are many, many people around the earth that remember that gift that gift that you sent to us that gift that 30 some odd years later you your words were that you were proud of him that tells us that that gift, those examples for over 30 years that were sent to us, that you're telling us, here's my son, do it like he did, and I'll be proud of you too. Help us to remember that, Lord, every day of our lives, to do it like he did. Let's remember his broken body right now as we take this bread and we just thank you Lord in Jesus name Amen
Our Father, as we continue on in our prayer, thinking now of, of that blood, that cleansing blood that saved us, that same blood that was born in your Son on this earth that he used his life that he gave to us at the end of his life to further ours, to give us that hope and to give us that gift of eternal life with you. We thank you, Lord, for that gift of that blood. And again, pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to do our uh, collection and change for Jesus. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we are not in need, that we don't have to worry about what we will eat or what we will wear. We pray that as we give, we will remember all the blessings you've given to us. We'll support the works of the church here. We'll support the works for children, and, and even more, we'll see opportunities that you give us to help those who do not enjoy the, the material things that we enjoy. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to do our regular collection. Children, if you'll come up, we're not going to come up on stage, but if you'll come right over here, the cups are over on this side this morning. A little bit different, but I think we can deal with it. So children, I need you to come right over here where I'm pointing, this way. Miss Beth and Miss Linda and their husbands have the cups. And if you have some loose change, uh, you can, uh, you'd like to give, we'll do some good works for children with that money as our children come by with the cups.
Now, while we continue to do that, let's sing a couple of Christmas carols to get us into the lesson. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Wild fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me. to heaven to live with there. Welcome again. Good to see everybody. Uh, wanted to mention today starts a new quarter in classes. Uh, Jim Stanley, I believe, is teaching in the gathering room and Kenny is uh, in room 11. So uh, new, new classes are starting up. If you haven't been staying and participating in Bible study, I encourage you uh, to do that. Obviously, there's classes for all the other age groups and uh, a variety of other things going on. <clears throat> I did see uh, Ethan walk in back uh, there today. Good to see Ethan, uh, Kevin and Christina, son Ethan. He had an injury a while back now and been uh, dealing with concussion and uh, just a, a lot of recovery from that, and so it's good to see Ethan with us today. All right, as Mickey said, uh, we you know doing those different topics through our Belief series, but with December starting, we're going to do some Christmas thoughts. Uh, not going to really do a series. Each one will be independent, uh, just as we, we think about a few things together. And uh, I'll, I'll be out of town next week. Randy will be speaking. So I encourage everybody to participate. And then we'll, we'll come back and have a couple of other thoughts as we get closer to Christmas. How many of you enjoy this time of year? <clears throat> well, most of you do, huh? Most of you like Christmas? I'm at that point now, I enjoy Christmas. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a relaxing time of year for, for me. I generally, uh, like a lot of you, have 
you know, you work all year, and I, I use a lot of leave uh, in the government. We, you know, if you don't use leave, they call it user lose. I generally have a lot at this time of year, so I take it, uh, you know, and I got a lot of time off, so work around the house, put up the decorations. I enjoy the house being decorated. There's just a lot of fun things uh, that I enjoy for Christmas. And like next week, we'll be going. We, we were married, uh, Chris and I were on December the 11th, and so typically this time of year, we try to take a trip uh, around Christmas uh, as well as our anniversary. And so it's, it's just a fun time. I look forward to it. But it hasn't always been that way. So <clears throat> there's, there are a lot of folks, and I have been at a place in my life where I didn't really enjoy Christmas very much. And some of you with young kids, there's a lot of fun things with kids and Christmas, but it can also be very complicated. And, I, you know, I, you would think that I would reflect back in when I had little kids, that would have been when Christmas was really fun. Well, I thought Christmas morning and just them opening their presents, that was fun. But most of the other stuff associated with all of it really was not fun. It was really, back then it was, I, I thought it was kind of stressful, a lot. Now, one of the problems with us is, uh, many of you know, I was divorced, so we, you know, you had to manage that time of uh, Christmas with, you know, where the kid's going to be and, you know, what's going to be going on there. And then we used to think we were obligated to having family together at Christmas. And uh, really, from my side of the family, that was a lot more of a struggle. Can anybody relate? I mean, I remember one time, some of my family came for Christmas and Christy had been cooking all day. She had this great meal prepared for everybody, and they got there, and, you know, we were sitting around talking a little bit, and I said something about, hey, y'all ready to eat? Uh, Christy's, you know, you know, what time you want to eat? Christy's cooked, and the comment was, you know what? We really would rather not eat here. We'd rather go to Shogun. I'm like, you know what that does to your wife who's been cooking all day? Not much, yeah. One, there was another year that we didn't even get to the meal, and the conversation was sort of strained, so they just left. Uh, <laughs> that's hard to imagine, isn't it, Beth? I, not, none of you have families like that, right? I'm the only one. Yeah. And then your kids get a little older. Can you relate to this? And uh, as they get older, one of the, you know, when they were younger, I always thought one of the neat things of Christmas morning was impressing them. You know what I mean? Like they wake up and it's like this, wow, I can't believe that. You can relate to that, right? And Jim, I see Jim, it's good to have Jim and Carrie, but Jim, can you remember the day when you recognized or realized, I don't make enough money to impress my kids anymore? <laughs> can you relate to that? I mean, you know, okay, when you start buying their stuff, it, it, it's not going to be. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad, but, uh, you know, overall, it, it, is, it is, for most people, a, a nice time of year, but it can be very complicated, and it's really tough for people that have lost family members that are close to them, uh, you know, siblings or maybe even parents or, or their mate, uh, children. Uh, it, 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 can be, it can be a really stressful time of year because it puts you into uh, you know, a, a memory of when it, what it was like and how it was when they were all there. Anyway, here's what I want you to think about, though. And, and we're, we're only going to make one really point today is here's a couple of reminders that you need to keep in mind. This time of year, a lot of holidays, they, they put into the, I guess, the conscious of our mind, just in the, the forethought, they bring into focus a lot of problems that we can't solve. Right? You know, it, it was wonderful when I finally realized, as I looked around at other families in our family, that there's some people you're just not made to sit around a table and talk for three or four hours. You know? Yeah, y'all know people like that. Do you know, you know situations and you know people maybe that have relationship issues and they had all their life? And, and you know what? There's problems like that you can't solve and you're not going to solve. And the sooner you get over it, the better you're going to be. All right? Not only are there problems we can't solve, but there's people we can't control. So you might as well just stop trying to. They're what they are, you're what you are, and you just need to accept this. As well as there's expectations that we just can't meet. I say that, you know, as children grew older, uh, Spencer more than Brittany, but there were, there were expectations he had about what a mom and dad did for their kids at Christmas, and I couldn't meet them and sometimes didn't 
want to meet them, but th th that's okay. And not just their expectations, but other people's expectations of what you should be and, and how it all should work. You got to keep this in mind. There are problems we can't solve, but for the most part, I am the one with the problems that have not been solved. Do you know that? Yeah, we look around, tend to, and pick out all the problems with everybody else and why they can't solve them. But if you'll really step back and look at it, more than likely you are the one that's a whole lot of the problem. Also, there's people we can't control, but I am also the one that typically can't be controlled. You know, there's a lot of other, did you know there's a lot of other people around you trying to control you because they think you need to be controlled? But you don't recognize that problem with yourself. And then finally, I am the one setting expectations that others can't meet. Uh, we made a point, we've made it several times, every time this comes up, I really like to emphasize this because this is important for you in just how you deal, work with people, and have relationship. Most conflict, do you remember this? Most conflict in relationships come because of what? I have put expectations on that other person that they either can't meet, don't want to meet, aren't going to meet, but because I expect that, then I get frustrated, and it puts a barrier in our relationship when they don't meet that. Remember that? It makes a lot of, and it really happens with your kids. You know, a lot of us put expectations on our kids. Like, you know, I, I would have wanted Spencer, for example, and Brittany was the same way, but the, you know, to maintain like certain grades. That was important to me. It wasn't always that important to him, but it would become a conflict, right? And what was the conflict? For the most part, it was because I put an expectation on him that was healthy for him, sure, but he was not nearly as interested in meeting that expectation as I was. Now, for a parent, you have to manage those, but you understand. I also put expectations on Christy or people around me, and when you do that and they don't meet them, then you get frustrated. All right, so all, the, all, all this stuff is really, again, just brought more into focus, <clears throat> and we tend to pay more attention to it when families are together and during holiday season. All right, so what are we going to learn today? That Christmas really is, and the message of Christmas really is, a wonderful story. Because Christmas should not be about, this time of year should not be about who I spend it with, but it should be a constant reminder of who is for me, who is really pulling for me. You know, this time of year, we tend to focus like the Gospels do in the starting out. We, we focus our message all around the birth of Christ. You know, that's typically what the stories are. And there'll be messages and series of lessons and thoughts. And you'll see the manger scene. And you'll see all these things that are all focused on the birth of Jesus. And it's certainly important. When you read the four Gospels, tell the story of the life of Jesus. Three of the four start off with what? Okay, let's talk. I'm going to talk for a few minutes. What do they start off with? They tell the story of the birth of Christ, right? And we have all these manger scenes and the nativity scene, and we look at all that. And, and it, like we do with most things, we dress it up like it's a really pretty story. And we're not going to go into the story of Jesus' birth, but you do know it was not a pretty story, right? And there was nothing pretty about the birth of Jesus, even though we make it all look really neat with the manger and the shepherds coming. And, but, you know, the, the story is nothing like we portray it. We portray it that way because it makes us feel good. But John's gospel, when we go over there, it's really interesting. When he tells his gospel, or when he writes his gospel, he does not start with the nativity scene. He didn't start with the birth. Let's think about this for a minute. John was an older guy. The others wrote when they were a little younger. John was an old guy. I say older. John was an old guy when he wrote his gospel, when he told his story. Most of us, if we tell a story, we would tell it from a very different perspective when we're 65 or 70 than we would when we were 35 or 40 or when we were 15 or 20, Right? I mean, if we're relating something, because as we go through life, we find different things are more important to us. We find different things of greater value to us. 
and we tend to focus on those. So it's important to understand John was older. Not only was John older, you got to reflect on the period of history that John lived in. Some of you enjoy history a lot, some of you maybe not as much, but you cannot read these gospel writers, you can't read the story of Jesus and those that lived after him without putting into your conscience the framework of the world that they lived in. John, as I said, was older. He had lived through one of the most troubling and disturbing times for his people. The Jewish nation under the rule of Rome, it was, it was just a very ugly time. I put this picture up. Nero, who was one of the emperors, and then Vespasian, he was a ruler that really had a lot of involvement with Jerusalem, Judea, with the area that John and his friends and his family lived in. And Vespasian and Rome were not kind at all. John had seen, I don't know if he was in Jerusalem at that time, we don't know exactly where he lived, don't know exactly where his family members were, but John had lived through the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem when there were over one million, can you imagine one million of his Jewish brothers and sisters slaughtered? Two or three hundred thousand of them taken captive as slaves. You think about the, the impact that 9-11 had when in New York and a couple other places, you, you know the destruction and the tragedy, and you think back to how that changed your life. Can you imagine, can you imagine if those evil powers that are against the United States actually came in and slaughtered people on the streets in front of you just at these alarming rates, and you were scared of your life because they may kill you or take you and sell you as slaves. This is what John lived through. He lived through the tragedy of those that he was closest to, like Peter and Paul, his closest friends executed because of their belief in Jesus, their trust in God, their unwillingness to denounce that, and John was right there with them in his belief. He had lived through all of this. Remember John when he was at the cross? John when he was at the cross. He witnessed the death of Jesus. And then he had watched the impact that death and that life had had. And now he's older and he's reflecting. Later in the book, he said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In other words, what's John saying? He said, I I'm writing some things to you, but I want you to understand there's a whole lot of other stuff that took place. I'm not, I'm not writing all that, but there were a lot of other things that Jesus did. But the things that are written, they're written why? So that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute, that you may have life in his name. I said he was at the cross. Do you remember what Jesus looked and what he said to John, this John that wrote this gospel, and what he said to Mary, his mother? What did he say? He said, John, basically he said, John, I want you to treat her like your mother, right? I want, I want her to be your mother. And Mary what? I want him to be your son. In other words, Jesus, sort of in a way of a, a will, a verbal will, was saying, this is how I want this to play out. So for the remainder of his life, and we, again, don't know exactly where they lived or how it took place, but John would have cared for Mary, and Mary would have cared for John. How many times do you think they sat around in various environments, and John heard Mary tell the story of the birth of Jesus? What do you think? You think that was a story he heard often? Can you imagine her telling about her and Joseph and making the journey? People would have been questioning, especially after the resurrection of Jesus. Can't you imagine everywhere that Mary went? What would people want? They'd want to know. Tell me all about Jesus, right? 
Tell me the story. I built all that up to say, so when John is older now, and he's going to write his story, his gospel, he's going to tell us about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all start out telling the nativity scene that we're so familiar with, right? It's right there in the, you know, they they open up the story with that. And it's coming to John, who would have been best able, do you think, to have told the story of the birth of Jesus? Who do you think? His mother? And who did she care for and who cared for her? John. You say, well, Ray, you you, you made the point. Okay, I hope I've made the point. Because I want you to understand that John, then, when he's at the end of his life and he is writing a message to you, and he's writing a message for Christmas, but he's writing a message for all time. And he opens up his book. He does not start talking about the miraculous birth of Jesus. He starts by saying, in him was life. In him was life. I told you the message of Christmas is not about who you spend it with, but it's about who's for you. Who is for you more than anyone? Jesus. Who lived and died and was raised to give you what? Life. In him was life. And I tell you a brief background because here's what John is saying. I was there. I spent some time with him. I was at the cross, and I have lived with his family. I've lived with his mother. I have watched the destruction of our country and our people. I have watched my friends and my family lose, in many cases, everything. Again, the devastation that he had witnessed among his people is really impossible for us to imagine. And at the end of his life, what John wanted the people to hear is that in spite of all of that, in Jesus Christ is life. Rome may come and take your life. Rome may take you or your friends or your family and sell them into slavery. Rome may tax us beyond our ability to provide for our family. In spite of all of that, if I choose to be in Jesus, I have life. There's a lot of folks troubled for a lot of reasons in our country today. There's a lot of people nervous about the direction of our country. There's a lot of folks, again, at this time of year that life is just so complicated for. There's a lot of you that are struggling individually with a variety of whether it be finances, relationship, illness, whatever it might be. John is saying it doesn't matter how far down it may go. In Jesus, there is always life. Later he said that Jesus, John was telling us, Jesus told us, the reason I came was to give you life. That's why I'm here, is to give you life. And I want you to have abundant living. Again, that that doesn't mean I want you to have a big checking account. It means I want you to have the joy of living life at its fullest. And that's why I came. He said, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. One of the things I love about Christmas is the various lighting. Do you? I like to go see Christmas lights. But I love a room that's sort of dim and there's candlelight or whether it's the light of the fire. You know, you think about those, the very first picture I had up there. I love that kind of lighting. That soft, just soothing lighting. And when I think of Jesus and the light that he offers, that's what I think of. In the midst of any trouble, 
there is this calming light that shines through the darkness of your worst moment, and it gives you light. That's Jesus. John says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, I tried to build it to this one point to give the perspective. John, older in life, you understand what he's been through. You understand what his country's been through. You understand what he has seen. John, in his lifetime, saw a lot of darkness. And when he was writing, he said, in Jesus there is light, or there is life, and that life is the light. And here he said, guess what? No darkness. In the worst day of Jewish history, At the hands of a cruel Roman Empire, in the worst day, John said, all of the darkness that was provided to our nation, or not really provided, all the darkness that was poured out on our nation, even in that darkest moment, it could not overcome the light of Jesus Christ. So my encouraging message as we close for us, is maybe this is a complicated time of year for you. If not, there are certainly seasons in our life where it's pretty complicated. The Christmas story. Y'all remember the Christmas story? Right? The Christmas story. How many of you like that movie? Those of you that don't know the movie, what's going on here? I don't remember the kid's name. What's his name? Who? Ralphie? All right. What's the one over here? That's Ralphie, isn't it? Do what? Schwartz, all right, whatever. I don't know if, I can't remember if it's a dare. I didn't, obviously, I didn't prepare enough for this moment, right? No, double Do, dog dare. Yeah, double dog dare. I, all I can think about is the lamp. You know, it's, <laughs> anyway. If you hadn't seen it and don't know what I'm talking about, it's a, you might want to go watch it, all right? But the double dog dare was to stick his tongue up against this pole that was freezing and his tongue got stuck. i just give you this. It just is a visual reminder. That, at that moment, had to be as bad as bad as it could get for that little boy, for shorts, right? As bad as it can get, Jesus is the life, and he provides the light. That is a message we can truly focus on. I believe we're going to sing, O Come All You Faithful, right? O Come All You Faithful, and the appropriate way to end Remain faithful in your desire to serve and to live for him and enjoy the light and the life that he's wanting to pour out into you. Let's stand and sing. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come. Appearing, oh 
come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Pray with me. God, we're thankful so much for this day and uh, dedication of these young ones to you. Um, thank you for the blessings on the families, God, and um, help us to also be a blessing to them as we watch these children grow um, and make this church, God, and be with us always and through this day and as we study in Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.